Hi guys, Nick here from Conservation Careers and welcome to the podcast. Now today we're speaking with Dr. Kate Evans, who's the founder and director of Elephants for Africa. She's an award-winning behavioral ecologist and conservation biologist with over 25 years running wildlife research and conservation projects within Africa. Now, since establishing the charity in 2007, Kate has been responsible for funding their applied research, education and community development projects through Southern Africa. And through that, she secured over one and a half million pounds from trusts, foundations, corporate sponsorships, including Hugo Boss, uh, private donors, online campaigns and events. And in this podcast, we talk about her journey in establishing Elephants for Africa as a charity, as an NGO, and what she's learned along the way. We also discuss the impacts elephants have on local communities and how they can both exist more peacefully together. Finally, we also chat about the importance of fundraising as a core skill that aspiring and professional conservationists should develop within themselves before we announce that Kate's actually going to be the course leader for our latest training course called Fundraising for Conservation Projects. As always, it's a fun, informative and inspiring chat. Enjoy. Hello, I'm Kate Evans, and I'm founder and director of Elephants for Africa. Wonderful. Thanks for jumping on the podcast, Kate. It's really nice to chat. Uh, we've been starting to get to know each other a little bit recently, and it's a good time to kind of get you on the podcast and share you and your story with our audience a bit more widely. Um, where should we start then? So you're founder and director of Elephants for Africa. Let's talk about Elephants for Africa, and you're wearing a lovely elephant pendant. Uh, necklace at the moment so what what is elephants for africa uh, tell us a little bit about this this amazing charity that you set up well um i always had a vision of setting up a long-term elephant research program monitoring program um you know inspired by others before me that have done the same but also on the understanding that you know for such a long-lived um, keystone species if you study them for three to five years yes you're going to get interesting information but it really is a snapshot mm. um, as we know and understand animals and their behavior are influenced by ecosystems and those ecosystems change and I think that's what's been missing in a lot of our conservation strategies um, is that we have been I think rather short-term um, visionaries in the past taking a snapshot of what an ecosystem looks like and what species are in there and going, well, that's what we need to preserve. And preservation and conservation are, are different in that respect. Um, and then, you know, we need to be particularly now thinking about the implications of climate change and how those ecosystem shifts and may or may not provide for species and elephants being one of those which are currently where we work moving outside of protected areas in alarming numbers mm. so um yeah that's why i started elephants for africa initially but um it's been a long journey <laughs> and then the other thing the other thing that i'm really interested in is individuals and again that i think that's been remiss in our conservation strategies is we've looked at numbers um and gone okay have we got enough elephants here and have we got enough lion and what's the carry capacity and all this and then really we've we've really not included individuals and the importance of individuals in um population dynamics but also importantly in social populations so social biology mm -hmm. and elephants are, are very social and my work actually focuses on males which until relatively recently have been thought as solitary. And once they leave their herd, they're past their, you know, they don't need other elephants. And, you know, our work and other elephant research work is showing, well, they actually are very social and they need each other and they need older and younger bulls to surround them. So if we are um, ignorant of that when it comes to management and numbers, there are repercussions. Um, so, yes, that's kind of what we're about is focusing on on the future conservation strategies and also male elephant ecology specifically. Interesting. Okay, so you want to look at the longer time scale of elephants rather than snapshots. You want to understand more about individuals, particularly males. And is it with a view to conserving elephants in the longer term? Is and is it very research focused, or do you have practical conservation? projects underway at the same time lots of questions there sorry <laughs> take it yeah well. <laughs> yeah well again um I call I've always called myself a conservationist in fact one of my nicknames at school was conservation Kate you know I was that <laughs> nagging person recycle <laughs> reduce reuse um 
And, um, you know, that's been key to who I've always been, that and animals. And so I started off and my interest is animal behavior, which you probably picked up on. Mm -hmm. And I did a zoology degree. And then I went off to save the world and elephants in particular as a, you know, a young 21 year old full of ideas and theory. And, you know, the reality is very different. Uh, yes. So for a long time, I was there in the Delta. I was um, I set up uh, my PhD, which then went on to become the foundation of Elephants for Africa on elephants, male elephants in particular in the Okavanga Delta, you know, a World Heritage Site now, an incredible area for biodiversity and incredible area for wilderness. And it took me a good 10 years to realise to be a conservationist. You know, was I being a conservationist? Yes, I think animal behaviour and understanding it in a wild environment is incredibly important to ensure that we enable those natural behaviors in in conservation strategies but it suddenly dawned on me that to be a a more effective conservationist i need to be working with people and so we relocated after 10 years in the delta down to the maharikari pans national park again in botswana we haven't covered that yet but that's where our, our work is mainly based in botswana and um there is a predominantly male elephant population. So in the Delta, when I initially went there, it was predominantly male. It's what we call a bull area. Again, we don't really understand what all that's about, and that's an element of our work. But down in Makarikari, um, we're situated on the western border, and it's a hard border. The Delta has these lovely buffer zones, community-owned land, which is leased out to um, um, lodges and other interested parties. Mm -hmm. But we have a hard border, and then in 2009, the Pateti River, which is on, on that western border, flooded, mm. uh, which it wasn't meant to do, according to many geologists. And that brought in wildlife and humans and conflict or competition for resources escalated. Yes. Yeah, so our, our, our work is very much applied. So what we we really think it's important to understand male elephant biology and their needs from a social and ecology ecological perspective so we can then you know, look to create a human wildlife landscape where humans and wildlife can coexist in a safe environment. Okay, I understand. Yeah. What are some of the conflicts then that um, that exist between particularly elephants and humans then in the landscape that you're that you're studying them within? and, And how do you go about, you know, managing that and helping them to kind of coexist? Yeah, I mean, throughout their range, elephants, as you know, are herbivores and uh, we rely on on crops. And that's very, very tasty to a large mammal. And they're very, very intelligent. So mitigation strategy, I think in the past, again, even when it comes to our conservation policies, well, we'll put up a fence. That's that's fine. But, you know, they're clever and they outfox us. And um, they're quite big, too. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, they're very big. And we need to be evolving and thinking again. I, I think that we've often looked at it from a very human perspective, um, which, you know, is natural. But we really need to increase looking at it from an animal perspective for conservation strategies, but also for mitigation strategies. And if you look at an elephant, you know, a very iconic species, um, they're pretty unique if you, you know, forget how common they are in our culture. But if you actually break it down, they're weird. They have these ridiculously large ears and this long nose and that tells you something about how they perceive their environment sound and smell are incredibly important so you know let's use that in our mitigation strategies let's use that in creating an environment where we can communicate to them you know you're actually not welcome here it's safer if you go elsewhere Mm. so um when it comes to our environment implying it what we have is a, a fairly unique environment in that the communities bordering the national parks, some of them have not had to deal with elephants for one or two generations. Mm. So what, what's happening in Botswana is, is historically the elephants and much of the wildlife population was pushed up to the north. Mm. And over time, they're re-expanding, recolonizing, for want of a better term. Mm-hmm. Um, and throughout their range, some t- um, elephants require land outside of protected areas i mean that's just what they do but they tend to move through and now they're re-expanding and this area some of the as i said haven't had to deal with it so a big element of our work is just being an information provider access Mm -hmm. to information Mm -hmm. about what works elsewhere access to information about how you interpret animal behavior elephant behavior what is that animal telling you so you can have a safe or safer interaction with them now these communities are 
reliant on subsistence farmers. I think there's, you know, 70% of them rely on subsistence farming. So cropping is incredibly important to them. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we enable them to protect that really valuable asset and that valuable livelihood? Mm -hmm. So slowly but surely, we've trialed, we've got farmers engaged, and we've been we've been um, enabling them to trial mitigation strategies that work for them. We have a whole toolbox of mitigation strategies that have worked in India and in Africa, but that doesn't necessarily, they're going to work here, you know, from a cultural and ecological perspective. Yeah. So again, we've just given them access to information about what works elsewhere, understood what they're willing to trial, get funds to enable them to trial that. And by, I think that approach, you know, we do see the farmers and the communities as partners. Um, they now see us as a valuable resource and a valuable partnership um, to help deal with them, you know. So, yeah, that's how our approach is and what we try and do. That's that's really interesting. How how typically do local people view elephants? Like, I guess, culturally, you know, are there something that's always been viewed as a threat? Are they at some level, you know, revered or, you know, ha and has that changed over time? Yeah, I mean, many, many cultures do revere elephants, including our own. <laughs> yeah. We don't have to live with them. Yeah. Um, and I think there there is, it's very difficult to revere something that's eating your life yeah. and you know killing your neighbors and yeah. posing a threat to life and livelihood however having said that you know they are revered there are um myths and stories about elephants that are crucial and, and integrated into their culture um and also um some tribes have their they each have a totem animal, which means that they can't have touched that animal. If they, you know, they can't touch the dung, they can't be associated with that animal. So in a way that creates a conservation yeah. hot spot for yeah. that species. So I think there's, there is um, respect, there's fear, and there's um, a lack of access to information about mm. the importance of them um, and, you know, how best to avoid a negative interaction with them so again i think yeah. on, on one another aspect of we which we focus on is taking children in particular but also elders from time to time into the national park so this is a national park that they can see from their community yeah. see from their schools but very very few in fact i don't think any had ever been into the national park Gosh. prior to us getting involved with them um so when they see them we took a teacher group in a couple of years ago. The pandemic has kind of messed all that up. Um, and their in, initial reaction when they came across the elephant was to get out of the car and run, <laughs> which obviously would have been a very negative thing to do. And so by having them and giving that opportunity with a researcher, with um, Tata, our researcher, he can then explain. He's actually from the community, one of the communities. He can explain about what the elephant's doing, how important it is to the ecosystem, so those opportunities are, are really, really valuable, I think. Yeah, it's funny how we sort of forget that these communities are so excluded to this thing that's so close to them, which as a tourist or as a researcher, you feel you have access to and you can enjoy, but it's right on the doorstep. Yeah. Um, I'd love to know a little bit more about the actual organisation that you just mentioned, Tata. Can you just give us an idea of, you know, who works, how is it structured, what sort of different roles and the skills and people are involved? And perhaps as part of that, can you tell us about how, the journey of kind of creating it you know where, how did you start it and how has it evolved over time yeah yeah sure so in fact perhaps if I knew what it involved uh before I set it up I probably wouldn't have set it up <laughs> just because it's a lot of hard work I mean you're basically running a business right. and um I'm a zoologist and I don't have business training so there's been a lot of on-job learning um, you know, a communication is so important when it comes to donor relationships and your scientific findings, all these incredibly important things. And when you when I started out as a zoologist, I was like, well, I've got my zoology degree, that's it. And now I'm a little bit older, perhaps a little bit wiser. I realize, oh gosh, I wish I'd spent more paid more attention in history lessons, in English lessons, in all these really important aspects of conservation. You can't go into an area and ignore its history, its geology, its yeah. language, its culture, and be an effective conservationist. So um, yes, why did I start Elephants for Africa? Well, as I mentioned, I wanted to set up a long-term elephant monitoring program. Yeah. And uh, I realized that in spite of my 
um, difficulties in academia, I needed to go back to academia to get more qualified, more skills. And this more is knowledge. after your PhD, is it, or before? No, no, this was before my PhD. Okay. So after I'd got my degree, I thought that was it. You know, I've had enough learning. I'm enough of academia. I'm mm-hmm. off. But, you know, ignorance is bliss. And then slowly but surely I realised that, you know, further degrees would be very worthwhile. So I ended up doing a master's online parasitology and then finally setting up my PhD um, independently um, on elephants in the Delta. Mm -hmm. So that was my journey. And and, getting a PhD, I'm incredibly proud of that, but that was never my primary goal. My primary goal was this long-term monitoring programme. During my PhD, I I was able to attract funding and funders and um, friends and family got on board. And I realized, okay, well, that's wonderful. They trust me and enable me. But it would be great if that money was going through an entity which is regulated. Mm. And, you know, people then have faith and more faith, I guess, other people that don't know me personally, (laughs) that it's being, you know, properly regulated, properly spent and all the rest of it. So that's why I set up Elephants for Africa. Initially, I tried to set that up in Botswana as an NGO. That was slightly more complicated than a charity in England and Wales. So I went that route. And then finally, in uh, 2016, we got registered in Botswana as well as an NGO. So that's great. Mm -hmm. So who's involved? We have a a wonderful board of trustees and a a board in Botswana Mm -hmm. um, who support us. Uh, Particularly in Botswana, they're very involved in the education side and they are lodge managers, researchers, environmentalists, educators, teachers, uh, parent association members and parents, obviously, community members. So they all help us guide it very much from a cultural and educational perspective. And then uh, the trustees obviously support us by trying to find funds and and all the rest of it. So um, and obviously huge um, amount of knowledge, um, elephant experts as well involved there, lawyers, all those important aspects and skills, which I don't necessarily have. Um, And then on the ground, we're a very small team. (laughs) There's me who kind of runs everything and and looks like a swan flapping grace well i try and flap mostly on the surface and my legs but the feet are paddling first yeah exactly and i'm spinning all these various plates um but the team on the ground for the last four to five years we've really focused on having majority uh botswana citizens so um we are now we our aim was 80 percent at least and we've achieved that which is fantastic so on the ground um we have a community outreach and education coordinator Wallona. Mm-hmm. um so that's i think it's encapsulated it's rather a long title mm-hmm. and he's um heavily involved obviously on those aspects and then we have a a new education officer involved so he's now heading up all the schools aspects mm-hmm. our research officer and then we have two community outreach officers. So they live in the communities themselves. Mm. So we now partner with four communities. We've got two. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, we hope to expand to have one community outreach officer in each of them. So they are part of their communities and they're our main point of contact within those communities. And then we've just welcomed a new um, project manager as well. So that's great. So we've um, we're that's on the ground. And we've just got funding to reach out to another community and start working with their them as well so we'll have another community outreach officer there as well fantastic yeah and what time period are we talking here sort of 10 15 years or so and what's your goal for the future are you still looking to expand you know where, where are you going yeah so gosh um i guess i kind of i'm not my husband is very much what are you doing in five years time what are you doing? <laughs> and i guess i've rocked and rolled with life life has come with many challenges as we all have and I realize that those set goals is good to have a vision but for me I I've had to adapt and roll with the punches and I think that's what's kept things going so yes we have a vision but um history politics culture they they can change your vision and um so we're really focusing on that element of climate change and how animals are going to adapt and how humans are going to adapt and what that landscape might look like. Mm-hmm. Um, so, sorry, time scale. The charity was established in, when was it established? 2000, 2008. So, right. yeah, we're, yeah. yeah we're, 14 years old, yeah. Yeah. Is that right? Gosh, I should know this. Shouldn't I? That's okay. <laughs> yeah. It's, 
a while. Let's say that. 2007. I, I finished my PhD in 2006. So yeah, yeah. so 15, yeah. 15 years you've been going. Yeah. And you're talking yeah. about sort of rolling with the changes and, you know, having challenges, you know, put in front of you. I guess one huge challenge you must have faced the last couple of years is COVID and travel restrictions and perhaps changes in funding streams and support from donors and things like that. Could you maybe just like talk to how did how did COVID, how COVID impact elephants? For yeah, Africa? I was what I was you- actually in the field. Um so I'm not now permanently in the field. Um, we made a decision to move back to Europe at the time um, to really, that was at the time we moved from a, a predominantly corporate sponsorship up in the Delta down to Mahari Hari, where we had to really diversify income. So having access to good internet and um, potential to meet donors was really important. So we relocated, my, hus- my now husband and I, yeah. um, and I go out there for field studies and um, hopefully more field studies in the future less admin that's my yeah. aim i guess I if i had to have this vision it would be me getting back to field work like proper field work um yeah rather than students and my wonderful team on the ground our wonderful team on the ground yeah, yeah. And, well they're hard but enjoyable aspects of the work um so yeah covid came along and i was actually in the field and and we were talking about the implications we had a volunteer there we were trying to you know, she'd only just arrived and we were trying to really encourage her to go. You know, we were listening to news, said, look, we cannot make this decision for you. We don't want to be forced to do that, but we might have to. But you really, you know, this is serious. A pandemic is here. You know, this was at the early beginnings. And I literally got home, was concerned I wouldn't get home three days before borders closed. Wow. So, you know, that was a pretty scary time. And then immediately I was getting emails from funders saying, we we can't fund you anymore. Ish. So that was because we, 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 and still do have incredible support from local tourist operators. Yeah. And they're particularly interested in supporting our community work, yeah. um, our community outreach project. So that's fantastic. But obviously when those borders close, tourism in Botswana, which is very, very important to the economic stability of that country, just stopped. Mm-hmm. And, you know, these uh, lodge owners that we consider friends have de- devastating decisions to make. And unsurprisingly, our funding was cut, which mm-hmm. we completely understood. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> that had implications. <laughs> yeah, And it's been, it has been really, really difficult. So we had to budget. Um, our project manager at the time decided that she needed to be back home with family. Quite understandable. And so um, the team have been on the ground doing an incredible job of keeping things going. You know, everything was just stopped. Yeah. Our research, we couldn't go out. They couldn't go home. Um, even after that sort of initial lockdown they had in Botswana, there were then regional um, uh, travel restrictions. So some of our team are from Maun, uh, which is our sort of local service town, a good two hours north of us. So they couldn't go home, they can see family. And, you know, I think my main concern obviously was financial, but importantly was their well-being. Yeah. Be difficult for them. And I couldn't go and see them. I couldn't support them. So that's it has been very, very difficult. And we've had to really reach out to our large supporter base and, and be a little bit clever, <laughs> like budgeting, but also just uh trying to reignite some of those relationships and sustain them even though that we knew money wasn't coming it was important that we uh, well i recognize that they were going through difficult times so much of our money comes from zoological foundations and again they were hard hit so just that that short email saying i'm you know i hope everything's okay i hope your staff are okay or you know the your wildlife that's in your care is okay um you know we're all right this is what's happening our side and that has really paid back. So many of those zoological societies are now back funding us in a bigger capacity than they were initially. So that's right. encouraging. We've looked at corporate sponsorship as well, yep. um, engaging more on corporate social responsibility, and that's something we're developing. And then, yeah, looking at various grants. So as I said, I'm a zoologist, and I've had to expand now to, to more community work. So that opens up areas of um, grants which I wasn't aware of so lots of research on that front to look for um, new donors that might be interested in the community outreach work that we do yeah great and we can talk a bit more about fundraising in a bit too because we're running a course together around fundraising we can we can sort of share a, a bit of news around that as well um, 
But I, while we're sort of talking about COVID and the impacts of it, I was just listening to you and wondering, like, what were the impacts on the animals then? If there are fewer tourists going to the reserves, was there an impact on the animals, positive or negative or, or none? Yeah, I think that there's been quite a lot of work done, you know, throughout the world on that. And and during the pandemic, there's lots of lovely images of wildlife coming into villages and towns and cities. So, yeah. you know, given peace and quiet, yeah. the wildlife is there, which we often don't see. And, and they no doubt come in during the night and we don't see them. And then suddenly they were coming in during the day and, and people became much more aware. And I think that's a very positive thing. And I really hope that continues now we get back to some sort of what we've referred to as normality. Um, so uh, it's really difficult to know. Sadly, I think overall numbers have been hard hit because whilst rangers and tourists and guides were abiding by lockdown rules, um, illegal activity continued and flourished, mm -hmm. sadly. Mm -hmm. So I think poaching has escalated in certain areas. Mm -hmm. When it comes to... Um, behavior again we weren't able to go in during during the time of lockdown and it was a relatively short amount of time but i think one thing we are looking at is is um um how elephants react when we come along mm. due to increasing human activity you know does the crop raiding affect them in the national park are they more more aware of when we sort of trundle along in our noisy vehicle mm. so we we get that data and over time we can see if that actually has an impact when we went back to research were they a little bit more skittish mm. and a bit mm. more aware of humans coming into their landscape totally fascinating isn't it yeah i'd be interested to see what happens as a result of that research too yeah so let's talk a little bit about fundraising if we can so important for well almost all conservationists yeah. uh particularly if you're working in the charity sector and you're relying upon lots of different donor streams so whether it's grants from governments or private foundations or public donors and and campaigns or corporate sponsorships things like that um you must have learned a lot about i guess fundraising and how to go about fundraising through and um, kind of you know starting the foundation and if it's for africa and more um what <sighs> I was wondering, like, how do you feel about how important fundraising is for the kind of wider conservation movement, and particularly for kind of job seekers, people looking to get into the sector? Is fundraising a skill that people should be developing early on? Will it help them to become more employable, in your view? Yeah, I think it's vital. Um, you can't do conservation if you're not bringing in the funds. Now, you in your conservation career, you may not be a primary fundraiser, but if you're part of a team, you are going to be called upon to contribute to certain aspects of that, whether that's giving a public talk and engaging your followers or, or engaging new followers um, or creating that all important grant application. You are going to have to contribute to an element of fundraising, whatever that is, your social media posts. You know, we're conservationists are now all over social media. How do we engage? Well, you need to be writing engaging content, refer to what that, if you're doing a fundraising campaign online, what can that can help and contribute to and how it is helping and contributing to. So yeah, I think if you can prove that you have fundraising capacity, then you're, yeah, I would certainly go, oh, brilliant. I need some help on that front. Let's get them on the team. Um, yeah, so you're going to have to be involved, even if you're a field researcher, pure field researcher scientist, I would argue that you still need to be involved on some level in fundraising. Yeah, and I guess even whether you're working for a charity or not, like in the early days, even as a PhD student, you know, money kind of makes things happen, doesn't it? As conservationists, we often know what it is we want to do. We just need to raise more support to actually make it happen. And so even as an independent scientists, researcher, conservationists, whatever, you know, an understanding of how to secure funds, how to make things happen is going to help you in good stead. And then if you're working for different organization types, particularly charities across many different skills and roles, like you're saying, you know, it's, it's really beneficial to have. What are the kind of key sort of fundraising skills do you think people need to be sort of developing within themselves have you kind of thought that through a little bit because we are developing a course together it's going to go live fairly soon um i was wondering if we could just sort of touch on some of the sorts of elements that they would learn through the course but also that are obviously you know important to individuals when they're kind of thinking about training in this area yeah i like i've been in this game a long time so i i self-funded both my masters and, and my phd yeah. so um but even if you are a funded postdoc student there are always elements that you need whether that's additional equipment or um you know travel you want to do mm -hmm. another field research so i think 
from my own journey and your success rate on grants can be really demoralizing <laughs> and you know talking to other people you realize well that's normal so really targeting your grant applications doing the research on the donor what are their interests what elements of your work could they cover or might they be interested in cover so really at the beginning I had a scattergun approach I just need to go to everyone and those efforts were fruitful in that I learned through that way okay well why did they fund me oh it's because that's their interest or that's their mission or their vision so you know doing that research first would be really profitable or or good investment of time and then really looking at the grant and understanding what they're asking you in different sections so many of the titles i i I've learned over time, whilst they sound similar, actually the key points I need to include in that aspect is this, and the key point of that aspect is that. So not repeating yourselves in different sections. Mm. You're often limited on uh, word count. So, you know, I think over the years, I've learned how to be much more concise, much more positive in the language that I use, rather than we may, Mm. I will, Mm -hmm. you know, and, Mm -hmm. and funders are very understanding that things change the covid uh, pandemic for example we yeah. haven't been able to meet all our targets because we haven't mm-hmm. been out in the field funders are completely understanding if you have that again another really important skill is good donor relationships so if you can mm-hmm. see something's changing and you need to adapt your grant or your research you go back to them and say okay this has happened can we reallocate this money to this because of x y and z yeah. so that's really important skills and again um, the final thing, I guess, would, you know, that whole journey of finding the donor, applying for funding, uh, reporting, uh, doing the budgets, making sure that everything's ticking that all their boxes. And then well, what's next? Is that a grant that you can um, build on and apply again? Do you have to wait a couple of years before you can apply again? How do you maintain that relationship? So they go, oh, yeah, we worked with them in the past. They did all, all that they said they would. Um, where they couldn't, they told us why, and you know all their accounting's in order. So you can hopefully have a broad base of funders that you can approach for various aspects of your work. Yeah, and so important, so vital. I guess that sort of links through to a strategy, isn't it? Like a funding strategy. So you've got the donors that are already funding you, nurture them, grow them, keep them close, bring them along with you. Um, find new donors that look good and bring them in and grow that donor base and just keep reviewing and finding others. And some might be, I guess, not compatible and just leaving them be. It feels quite similar to kind of job applications from our side, like we're employing for jobs. Is it better to putting lots of applications to lots of different jobs and employers and hoping that some of them will stick? Or is it better to really double down, find exactly the right jobs that you're well suited to and put in really good applications and increase that kind of chances of, of success as a result? And you know, it, 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 so the, the latter process is often worthwhile more than um, you know, sending out lots and lots of applications that are of a lower quality, a poorer fit. Yeah, and it feels the same with, with fundraising too. Well, I'm really excited. I mean, we're going to go live fairly soon. We're going to call it Fundraising for Conservation Projects. Um, we're recording this in early August. It should be going live by mid-August and with a closing date of, I think, the 16th of September off the top of my head. Um, is when we're going to be closing enrollment for it. So if anyone's listening and wants to know more about how to do up fundraising, um, keep an eye on the website. It'll be coming out quite soon. End of sales pitch. Um, well, it's super exciting to be kind of working with you on that, Kate, as the course leader. Um, let's sort of round off. I'm very conscious of time. You're super busy. You're about to be kind of going abroad and doing more of your research in Africa. So I don't want to spend more time than we need to. But I'd love to hear your kind of career's advice, really, for others that might be listening. So people listen to us because they are aspiring to work in conservation. They're students, job seekers, maybe career switchers working in a separate field. And they might be inspired by you and your work and your drive, your passion, how you've actually started your own NGO and are kind of driving it forwards. What what advice would you give to people that like that who are listening about it and wanting to start and secure that first job and get their career going? Are there, are there any things that they should bear in mind that's going to help them to to move more quickly? What have you learned? Gosh, what have I learned over all these years? <laughs> <laughs> I think um, just not giving up. You know, it's very it can be very easy. There will be challenges. Um, you know, these last couple of years have been particularly challenging and there were times where I thought well you know I can't this can't go on but it has because we've built resilience into our strategy we've diversified our income stream we've built 
a, a network of wonderful supporters who really believe in what we do. And importantly, um, from my position, you know, I have this fantastic team on the ground who are equally as passionate as myself, equally moved and concerned about the communities we work with. And when you have that level of responsibility, you have to keep going. You know, mm-hmm. that's, I guess, yeah, the take home message is if you're passionate, you become involved and that can you know, maybe blur your vision of the reality, but it does keep you going through those really difficult, challenging times. And resilience, um, not just from a fundraising perspective, but, uh, you know, I think, I think again, if you are passionate about something, it's being resilient to those challenges, being resilient to people's negative and positive um, inputs mm-hmm. and listening to both of those elements um you know criticism constructive criticism has got me a long way you Mm -hmm. know and listening before speaking I guess that would be my biggest advice you know listen and don't go in expecting to make change immediately you will because you're going to be part of an environment but when we relocated down to Bacchari Kelly Pans National Park we've invested a lot of time in getting to know the communities there and building mm-hmm. trust mm-hmm. and i think trust would be another important element of of who you are so trusting other people um building trust with the, whoever you're working with in your team and importantly building trust in your followers uh, mm-hmm. so you you keep those followers whether they're funders or interested people so yeah resilience passion and yeah keep going you'll get there that's great. That's great advice. Really inspiring. Thank you. Um, and I guess as we wrap up, I'd love to hear like how do you how do you see the future of conservation, if you like? I, I feel like, you know, as a movement, we're we're having some great wins. You know, we're saving species and habitats and ecosystems in different places. You do some great work with elephants um in your particular research area, but globally the message seems to be fairly negative you know we're sort of losing the battle biodiversity wildlife whatever we call it seems to be declining and it's been impacted by us as humans are you optimistic for the future do you think we can turn it around and what as a conservation movement do we need to be better out do more of and you know why we're not making a bigger impact as a movement that's a big question Nick. (laughs) sorry i think and i guess it goes back to my other answer actually is um I, we all have to be conservationists you know we can't expect the bigger organizations to be all the solutions mm. so everyone and and whenever i give a talk or, or engage with people is is what small thing every day can you do to make the world a better place and that's being kind to other people but also being kind to your environment and i really hope and again you know i know that my social media feeds are adapted to my interests but throughout the pandemic people stopped and they listened mm-hmm. and they because they had to and they slowly but surely started looking at their own environment whatever that was and lots of people sought out nature and mm-hmm. found solitude there for their mental health and improving how they were feeling about the world but also just taking on board and realizing that we are part of this bigger ecosystem and we're now very much a global community so every small change that everyone can make now whether you're going to be a career switcher and become an active conservationist we like to call it but everyone 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 has to be a conservationist and that's how we stay positive and yeah that's what I was trying to refer to earlier is is you know I think to be a conservationist you have to be that half glass full mentality and that's definitely what I am otherwise I probably would have given up a long time ago you know when when I was growing up we had the what was called the ivory crisis and I never ever ever imagined that we would be living through a similar scenario on my watch, as it were, which we are, you know, we're down to less than 400,000 elephants now. Mm. And that's in in, uh, Africa. So the two species that live in Africa, and that's nothing, you know, Botswana where we're based is a sparsely populated um, human country. Mm -hmm. And that's a little over 2 million people. So Mm. when you talk about 400,000 elephants throughout the continent of Africa, which is vast. um, Yeah. It's not a, positive outlook but we have to remain positive because they're so culturally important and they're so ecologically important and they're so important to us as a species and I think recognizing that we are part of 
an ecosystem not above nature is key to each and every one of us to make that positive impact Mm, that's brilliant i love that and i love the message that we're all conservationists i think sometimes this label conservationists can feel quite sort of elitist like you sort of put on a pedestal you know because you're doing this important job yes you are but i think i totally agree i think anyone can use the term conservationist if they're trying to help at any level so yeah and and yeah if we can sort of mobilize more people even doing small actions it can make a huge difference so yeah that feels really a real positive note to probably end our discussion on and kate thank you so much for jumping on the podcast sharing your story for also being our course leader for the new fundraising course it's great to be working with you people want to find out a little bit more about you and uh, elephants for africa as well um where should we send them yes we have a website which is um www elephantsforafrica.org and then you know with similar names we're on facebook um instagram and twitter so we have social media outlets as well as our website so yeah please do get in touch um understand a little bit of our work more of our work on our website and then yeah engage with us more regularly on our social media sites fantastic great we'll put links as we always do in the podcast notes and uh yeah thanks again for joining the podcast great thank you nick take care You too. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, everyone. If you did, then please do hit the subscribe button to get notified of new episodes as they drop. Um, And also, please give us a rating or a review because it really helps us to get in front of more people. Now, if you want our help to get clear and get started and get hired as a professional conservationist, I recommend you enroll in our free online training program, exploring how to get a conservation job. So if you're a student, a job seeker or a career switcher, you'll learn the golden rule about how to get started, the key mistakes to avoid, and also we'll answer your biggest questions. You can check that out at conservation hyphen careers.com forward slash free. See you soon.